Third part of chapter four of the first volume of the Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. Nature, the true system of conditions. It is hardly necessary to observe that absolute experience can have no natural conditions. Existence in the abstract can have no cause, for every real condition would have to be a factor in absolute experience and every cause would be something existent. Of course, there is a modest and a non-exhaustive experience, that is, any particular sensation, thought or life, which it would be preposterous to deny was subject to natural conditions. St. Lawrence's experience of being roasted, for instance, had conditions. Some of them were the fire, the decree of the court, and his own stalwart Christianity. But these conditions are other parts or objects of conceivable experience which, as we have learned, fall into a system with the part we say they condition. In our groping and inferential thought one part may become a ground for expecting or supposing the other. Nature is then the sum total of its own conditions, the whole object, the parts observed plus the parts interpolated is the self-existent fact. The mind, in its empirical flux, is a part of this complex. To say it is its own condition or that of the other objects is a grotesque falsehood. A babe's casual sensation of light is a condition neither of his own existence nor of his mother's. The true conditions are those other parts of the world without which, as we find by experience, sensations of light do not appear. Had Kant been trained in a better school of philosophy, he might have felt that the phrase subjective conditions is a contradiction in terms. When we find ourselves compelled to go behind the actual and imagine something antecedent or latent to pave the way for it, we are ipso facto conceiving the potential, that is, the objective world. All antecedents, by transcendental necessity, are therefore objective and all conditions natural. An imagined potentiality that holds together the episodes which are actual in consciousness is the very definition of an object or thing. Nature is the sum total of things potentially observable, some observed actually, others interpolated hypothetically and common sense is right as against kant's subjectivism in regarding nature as the condition of mind and not mind as the condition of nature this is not to say that experience and feeling are not the only given existence from which the material part of nature something essentially dynamic and potential must be intelligently inferred but are not conditions inferred are they not in their deepest essence potentialities and powers kant's fabled conditions also are inferred but they are inferred illegitimately since the subjective ones are dialectical characters turned into antecedents while the thing in itself is a natural object without a natural function Experience alone being given, it is the ground from which its conditions are inferred. Its conditions, therefore, are empirical. The secondary position of nature goes with the secondary position of all causes, objects, conditions and ideals. To have made the conditions of experience metaphysical and prior in the order of knowledge to experience itself was simply a piece of surviving Platonism. The form was hypostasized into an agent, and mythical machinery was imagined to impress that form on whatever happened to have it. All this was opposed to Kant's own discovery and to his critical doctrine which showed that the world, 
which is the complex of those conditions which experience assigns to itself as it develops and progresses in knowledge, is not before experience in the order of knowledge, but after it. His fundamental oversight and contradiction lay in not seeing that the concept of a set of conditions was the precise and exact concept of nature, which he consequently reduplicated, having one nature before experience and another after. The first thus became mythical and the second illusory. For the first, said to condition experience, was a set of verbal ghosts, while the second, which alone could be observed or discovered scientifically, was declared fictitious. The truth is that the single nature or set of conditions for experience which the intellect constructs is the object of our thoughts and perceptions ideally completed. This is neither mythical nor illusory. It is, strictly speaking, in its system and in many of its parts, hypothetical. But the hypothesis is absolutely safe. At whatever point we test it, we find the experience we expect, and the inferences thence made by the intellect are verified in sense at every moment of existence. Side note, artificial pathos in subjectivism. The ambiguity in Kant's doctrine makes him a confusing representative of that criticism of perception which malicious psychology has to offer. When the mind has made its great discovery, when it has recognized independent objects and thus taken a first step in its rational life, we need to know unequivocally whether this step is a false or a true one. If it be false, reason is itself misleading, since a hypothesis indispensable in the intellectual mastery of experience is a false hypothesis, and the detail of experience has no substructure. Now, Kant's answer was that the discovery of objects was a true and valid discovery in the field of experience. There were, scientifically speaking, causes for perception which could be inferred from perception by thought. But this inference was not true absolutely or metaphysically because there was a real world beyond possible experience and there were oracles, not intellectual, by which knowledge of that unrealizable world might be obtained. This mysticism undid the intellectualism which characterized Kant's system in its scientific and empirical application, so that the justification for the use of such categories as that of cause and substance, categories by which the idea of reality is constituted, was invalidated by the counter-assertion that empirical reality was not true reality, but, being an object reached by inferential thought, was merely an idea. Nor was the true reality appearance itself in its crude immediacy, as skeptics would think. It was a realm of objects present to a supposed intuitive thought, that is, to a non-inferential inference or non-discursive discourse. So that while Kant insisted on the point, which hardly needed pressing, that it is mind that discovers empirical reality by making inferences from the data of sense, he admitted at the same time that such use of understanding is legitimate and even necessary, and that the idea of nature so framed his empirical truth. There remained, however, a sense that this empirical truth was somehow insufficient and illusory. Understanding was a superficial faculty, and we might by other and oracular methods arrive at a reality that was not empirical. Why any reality, such as God, for instance, should not be just as empirical as the other side of the moon, if experience suggested it and reason discovered it, or why, if not suggested by experience and discovered by reason, 
anything should be called a reality at all or should hold for a moment a man's waking attention, that is what Kant never tells us and never himself knew. Clearer upon this question of perception is the position of Berkeley. We may therefore take him as a fair representative of those critics who seek to invalidate the discovery of material objects. Side note. Berkeley's Algebra of Perception Our ideas, said Berkeley, were in our minds. The material world was patched together out of our ideas. It therefore existed only in our minds. To the suggestion that the idea of the external world is of course in our minds, but that our minds have constructed it by treating sensations as effects of a permanent substance distributed in a permanent space, he would reply that this means nothing, because substance, permanence and space are non-existent ideas, that is, they are not images in sense. They might, however, be notions like that of spirit, which Berkeley ingeniously admitted into his system to be, mysteriously enough, that which has ideas. Or they might be, what would do just as well for our purpose, that which he elsewhere called them algebraic signs used to facilitate the operations of thought. This is, indeed, what they are if we take the word algebraic in a loose enough sense. They are like algebraic signs in being in respect of their object or signification, not concrete images, but terms in a mental process, elements in a method of inference. Why then denounce them? They could be used with all confidence to lead us back to the concrete values for which they stood and to the relations which they enabled us to state and discover. Experience would thus be furnished with an intelligible structure and articulation, and a psychological analysis would be made of knowledge into its sensuous material and its ideal objects. What, then, was Berkeley's objection to these algebraic methods of inference and to the notions of space, matter, independent existence, and efficient causality which these methods involve? Side note. Horror of physics. What he abhorred was the belief that such methods of interpreting experience was ultimately and truly valid, and that by thinking after the fashion of mathematical atheists we could understand experience as well as it can be understood. If the flux of ideas had no other key to it than that system of associations and algebraic substitutions which is called the natural world, we could indeed know just as well what to expect in practice and should receive the same education in perception and reflection. But what difference would there be between such an idealist and the most pestilential materialist, save his even greater wariness and scepticism? Berkeley at this time, long before days of Ceres and tar water, was too ignorant and hasty to understand how inane all spiritual or poetic ideals would be did they not express man's tragic dependence on nature and his congruous development in her bosom. He lived in an age when the study and dominion of external things no longer served directly spiritual uses. The middlemen had appeared, those spirits in whom the pursuit of the true and the practical never leads to possession of the good, but loses itself like a river in sand amid irrational habits and passions. He was accordingly repelled by whatever philosophy was in him, no less than by his religious prejudices from submergence in external interests and he could see no better way of vindicating the supremacy of moral goods than to deny the reality of matter, the finality of science, and the constructive powers of reason altogether. With honest 
English empiricism he saw that science had nothing absolute or sacrosanct about it, and rightly placed the value of theory in its humane uses. But the complementary truth escaped him altogether that only the free and contemplative expression of reason, of which science is a chief part, can render anything else humane, useful, or practical. He was accordingly a party man in philosophy where partisanship is treason, and opposed the work of reason in the theoretical field, hoping thus to advance it in the moral. End of chapter 4, part 3